and you said that maximal autonomy leads to disappointment and an embrace of socialism and an all encompassing state. Uh, we're going to come back to that idea about an all encompassing state. Uh, but I also want to just reflect on a passage that you wrote here in chapter nine, talking about Solzhenitsyn. He said, the loss of many barriers, you write, the loss of many barriers against the individual will, Solzhenitsyn concluded, had paradoxically robbed Western life of its true freedom. An excess of rights had paved the road to a new serfdom, creating a society in which the Fetyukov character type thrived. Uh, could you expand on that? Because you just touched on it now. I think this is a very important idea that if you are to listen to the rest of our conversation, read your books and think about your solution at the end, which we'll get to, that if you don't understand this concept, then you know, you, you're not gonna understand all of it. So talk me through you know, this section, the freedom unto serfdom, quote, the problem with freedom, and why, why did it take Solzhenitsyn to, to see that coming here to America, the, the story in the book, and guys, everybody should get this book. It's tremendous, even if you don't agree with them. The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in the Age of Chaos. Why did it take Solzhenitsyn to come to Harvard and basically throw us throw us all under the bus? <laughs> Which is an okay, so let, yeah, amazing let's start. story. Yeah, let's start with a narrative context. Um, so, so Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great... Um, Russian dissident and writer, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, had um, uh, been played a pivotal role, really, in the in the downfall of communism, ultimately, in at least Soviet communism, um, because he was he blew the whistle, as it were, on what was happening in the gulag system, the network of prison camps that the Soviets ran, in which they ultimately imprisoned something like 18 million people, including Solzhenitsyn, having having been thrown into the gulag because he wrote a mild jibe against um, Joseph Stalin in a private letter, which was made its way to the hands of the secret police. He was condemned to a decade or so of, of hard labor in the gulag. So he went there and he wrote these books, um, the, the novel One Day in the Life of Divan, Ivan Denisovich, and um, this history, this larger history, the gulag archipelago. He had written all that, so obviously, he knew um, how barbarous and dehumanizing um, uh, Soviet communism was, and he had he detested it, and um, ultimately he was forced into exile over his work by the by the Soviet regime. So he comes to the West as this exile, and he is briefly in Europe. Then he settles in in the United States in rural Vermont. Um, but then he's invited to give a, a, a famous commencement address. He's invited to give a commencement address to the Harvard's graduating class of 1978. And um, everyone ha was expecting him to write a certain kind of, uh, to deliver a certain kind of speech. As Solzhenitsyn put it, in his, in, put it in his diary, he was expected to sing the immigrant's um, ode to the great Atlantic fortress of liberty. But when he comes to, to, to Harvard, he doesn't do that typical kind of song and dance. In fact, what he does is he levels a critique against the West that culminates in a statement that would have been extremely shocking at Harvard in 1978, where he says, where I asked if I would pose your society, meaning the West, as a model for the transformation of mine, meaning the nations trapped behind the Iron Curtain at the time, I would decline your offer. I would have to say no. I wouldn't choose the West, such as it exists today, as a model for the transformation of, of, of Central and Eastern Europe and Russia trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Um, so why did he say that? Well, obviously, he had tasted totalitarianism in, in its kind of communist variety, and he had no love for that. Um, but what he saw in the West was he noticed that somehow its notion of just maximizing individual rights had paradoxically created a society that was unfree, but the lack of freedom in the West didn't, wasn't the result of a large centralized state. It was more diffuse. It was somehow mainly private actors that um, 
uh, kind of lowered the moral horizon of the human being into this kind of selfish, you know, Wall Street man type, which he experienced firsthand because um, various people took control of the, his rights to his literary works, and they didn't care what was in them from a kind of literary or spiritual point of view. They just thought that this was, you know, a, an opportunity to make money. Or he saw it in the way that um, even dealing with his like contractor who was he hired to build his house in Vermont and the subcontractors, the way they like kind of took every le little legal advantage. None of it was illegal. Every, but every little legal advantage to like charge him a little bit more. Um, he saw it in the, the activity of the media, which even though in the media in the West didn't face the kind of censorship that existed in the Soviet Union, because of corporate agendas, they all kind of said the same thing. So there was this bizarre thing where he noticed that this is a free society. It's not supposed to be like the country that he left behind. And yet all the, um, you know, outlets kind of say this, they almost sing from the same song sheet. Now he was saying this in 1978, the phenomena has gotten much, much worse, obviously with a, with a mainstream media today, the way they're all just sort of, um, the way they parrot each other as though they, re they, there's like a morning memo that goes out where they all say the same thing. You know, today we know DeSantis murdered millions, you know, that, that they all have to say the same thing. He saw it in academia, the way he said your scholars all, uh, even though there's no open violence against them, the most truly independent minded persons get kind of marginalized and everyone just says the same thing. Um, and of, obviously he saw it in the kind of moral sexual degradations, which, you know, I, I can't imagine how, what he would have made of like the three-year-old twerking in Times Square today, because it wasn't as bad in the United States in the 1970s, but he already, it, all that kind of stuff was already festering um, in, in the, the America of the time that he saw. So just to make the, the, the final point, so what, what was happening? What he argued is that, um, again, the post-Enlightenment West, and especially the United States, had lost sight of a distinction that was very important to the ancients and to some of the found American founding fathers, I should say. And that's the difference between freedom to do what you ought to do, which is true freedom, and um, you know, the license to do as you please. Um, so that there is a, there is a, whether or not an act is fru truly free is gauged by its substantive content. A truly free act is an act of someone freely doing what you have to do as a human being anyway, as a man getting married, providing for a family, nurturing children. That's your responsibility. And in doing it freely, you're, you become more fully yourself. And in fact, the limits that marriage imposes on you liberate you because you're not constantly out looking for a hookup or looking for a kind of pornographic outlet, whatever it may be. By contrast, license to do what you will, um, its substantive content is not good for the human being. So for example, an obvious example might be opioids, you know, an opioid addiction, uh, you know, insofar as you treat pain, it's good. But if you become addicted, yes, you did it freely, but are, what's the substantive result? You're, you know, chained to opioids. If a, an 11 year old today encounters hardcore pornography, which as you know, Jack, something like 90% of uh, prepubescent, 90% of American boys will see hardcore porn before they turn, uh, before they hit puberty, which is kind of a, a bizarre phenomenon if you think about it. Um, they are gonna get addicted because that's how pornography rewires the brain and that you will become chained. Now, you, yes, you had the choice to do it, but now you're less free. So in, that's what, I, what Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn meant, and that's the point I make in that chapter, is that we have to recover the ancient distinction between freedom for the good and license for evil, which again, like someone like John Adams in the American tradition also recognized. So it's not like uh, you necessarily need a, a Russian mystic to tell us this. You, you can find it in the American tradition as well, this concept of freedom for good versus freedom for evil. So... <clears throat> That is the next set of questions is the context for this within the American founding. But before we get there, you said a couple of things that uh, I want to comment on. 
Uh, first of all, uh, Solzhenitsyn in the end of the 70s was able to sense our decentralized tyranny that we experience. Uh, it wasn't uh, as pronounced then as it is now, but if you look around at the coordination between the corporations, the media, the universities, and the government, you can see, and then, and then, and then just social shaming and such, you can see that there's actually a, a, a true fascism uh, at work uh, with corporate and the state basically fused uh, working towards the same goals. And then the the notion uh, that the tyranny is actually decentralized because it's not coming from just one place. It's coming from all over the place, which actually to me is terrifying uh, because uh, we are advocating in my uh, organization called the Liminal Order. We're advocating for decentralization because we know that it will lead to longevity because <laughs> it's harder to destroy something that's decentralized. And so if the tyranny is decentralized, that is scary to me. Um, then that's just a comment. My question uh, to you on what you had just said recently is you're pairing the word ought with freedom. And that just like hits me over the head like a hammer because it doesn't make any sense to me in my context that I've been given or appreciated over time. Ta address address that am i crazy to hear that as some sort of uh, contradiction in terms or in intent or spirit um t talk me through yeah. that and then and then also are you implying here that humans are inherently flawed and left to their own devices totally free they're going to end up in a bad place so let me address the first one uh first um the the account of freedom that you're used to, and it's the one that I always assume because we're all, we're you know it's been three four hundred years, depending on when you want to count, since the advent of of kind of liberal uh, uh, enlightenment philosophy. So we're so used to it that we we don't notice how it would have shocked the pre moderns. Is basically that freedom just means the freedom, the ability to choose from the maximum number of contraries, to use the kind of um, classic terminology. And what that means is, well, I can wear blue shoes, I can wear brown shoes, I can wear black shoes. And to be free means to have the, to be as unrestricted in, as possible in making my choices between those various contraries. Um, it's, it's, it's an unrealistic view. Now I get a little bit critical of it. It's an unrealistic view because, um, as I said, it doesn't take into account, you know, the possibility that, um, Substantively speaking, the, the blue shoes might be really bad for me. The blue shoes might be too tight. And if I wear them over time, it'll, I don't know, deform my feet or whatever. Um, and there, that, so um, that, um, yeah, I mean, the, it, it doesn't take into account what is the substantive content to which you are ordering the, the choices that you make from among the contraries that are available to you at a given time as a human being. Um, and the reason why I, it's not a contradiction to, to pair freedom with the concept of ought to, 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 to do what you ought to do is this, that if you agree, and we can discuss this, but if you agree that um, there is such a thing as an objective human nature and that um, therefore the human person um, uh, is most fully developed and most likely to find happiness by aligning himself by what is best in that nature um, and, and um, uh, uh, eschewing things that he can do but that ultimately are unworthy of human nature, then, then, it's, then it makes sense that freedom, your, your ability to choose, your ability to rationally uh, make choices should be ordered toward what it is as a human being that makes you happy. And so for a, for a, for a social animal, as human beings are, um, your, you, part of your freedom lies in being in community with other human beings. So for example, a choice that you might make as an individual or as a society in which people become more and more atomized from each other runs against what you ought to do as a human being as a therefore as a social animal as a social animal you want political community 
you want to hang out, you want to you want to have embodied interactions, um, sexual ones with women, uh, with, with one woman within the bounds of marriage, uh, you know, uh, bonds of friendship with with other people, um, family, so on and so forth. Now, if you make, for example, an individual choice, for, for example, the choice to view pornography, you're icing yourself from, set aside the social harms, but you're diminishing that side of you that is a social animal. And so you're doing what you ought not to do, and you suffer from it from various ways, and you become less than fully human. Um, so that, uh, to me, again, is why there's no contradiction between pairing freedom with with the concept of, of ought. And you can set, set, talk about it socially. If you set up a society in such a way in response to a disease that we know mostly harms uh, the elderly and the infirm, and you overreact to that to such a degree that you um, deprive people of their ability to socialize in a healthy way in the name of kind of absolute safety, that also is, is a collective choice that um, diminishes human nature and hurts be seen that with a kind of skyrocketing suicides and addiction rates over the course of these lockdowns. Um, so a, both an individual and a society can collectively distort the concept of freedom uh, or, or distort true freedom in such a way that it harms both the individual and the common good of the whole.